right. So uh, we have just been coming to the end of a series uh, called Who Do You Say That I Am? It's a series on the person of Jesus where we talk about him in the Old Testament, him in the New Testament, in the Gospels. And then we had last Sunday, it was Resurrection Sunday, uh, we talked specifically about him in that context. I actually want to kind of drag it on for maybe a week, maybe two more. And I want to talk about kind of like what now? What now? Like we talked about who he is and what he did and all that he said he was and how it all ties together. Remember, we tied in the Garden of Eden to the cross and we looked at all the parallels between those two things. Today, I want to talk about what now? Like what specifically does the Bible say about this transition that we have between Resurrection Sunday and life? Like for us today, we are in the continuation of that time, okay? So... I'm going to have some scripture verses. If you want to grab your Bible and follow along with us, that would be great. Um, We're going to start in the book of Matthew chapter 3, and we're going to look at some specific things and say, okay, so we know who Jesus is and what he did at the cross, that he rose on the third day. What do we do with that now, and what kind of should we expect, and what should be our goal, and what should be the things we're looking to try and do and see happen in our lives, and what's our job even in our world now that we're beyond Resurrection Sunday, or many call it Easter Sunday. So let's look at that. I'm going to start in Matthew chapter 3, like I said, verses 11 and 12. It says, now, a little context, this is John the Baptist speaking. This is before Jesus was uh, known to anybody, but really his mom and maybe some family. Uh, This is John the Baptist speaking. Now, a little bit more context, John the Baptist was the, the son of Elizabeth and Zechariah, who was Mary's cousin, Jesus' mother Mary's cousin. And this is the man who was the baby in the womb when Mary came to Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard Mary's voice, the baby in her womb leapt for joy, knowing that the Savior was there. This is that baby. He grew up to become John the Baptist. Okay, so this is what he says. Now, He's baptizing people in the Jordan um, and preaching repentance. This is what he says. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now think about this for a minute. If you've watched the, uh, the video series, The Chosen, which is really, really kind of cool, it, it builds story there that's not, we, the Bible doesn't say that is how it happened or it isn't how it happened. It stays pretty true to the things we do know, but kind of builds maybe this is what the story was like. So it's not like you're reading the Bible watching it, but it, it does kind of bring some of what happened in the Gospels to light. So um, cool thing to check out. In that situation, um, uh, the disciples and everybody are familiar with John the Baptist, and Jesus isn't really known. And when Jesus comes to John, John knows by the Holy Spirit that this is Jesus. Now, although their mothers were cousins, we have no reason to believe that they grew up together or knew one another. John says in that moment, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In these moments, we have to to know how important the fact is this is what they said at that time. This is what the gospel writers record in this moment. Listen, John could have said any number of things and certainly said a lot of things that we don't have record of, but God records two specific things that John the Baptist says in regard to Jesus that let's say they make the Bible. God is like, that is so important that I want the world to hear these things. The first one that's recorded is John saying, I baptize you with water for repentance, but one is coming who's greater than I. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. We got to realize that it's a big deal that John said this that he was baptizing with water for repentance, which is hugely important, but that the one coming after him 
would baptize them with the Holy Spirit and fire. What does that even mean? What does that mean? Let's look at uh, another scripture about the Holy Spirit because he is the transition. Once Jesus died, rose from the grave, he was with uh, on the earth for 40 days or so and then ascended and he said some specific things. Let's look at some of those. John chapter 16, verses 7 through 11. Jesus says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you, the helper being the Holy Spirit. But if I go, I will send him to you, and where he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will see me no more, no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. I like that last line a lot because it means the one who's in control in the world I live in is the one who died and rose for me. That's awesome. Ephesians 6, verse 17. If you're familiar with the word of God, you know this, this is where Paul talks the armor of God, put on the whole armor of God. I want to look at just one verse in here. Ephesians 6, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He wants us to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. What does that mean? It means that the very weapon that the Holy Spirit uses in our life, in our defense, and to conquer and accomplish the things God's called us to, is in fact the Word of God. When we plant the Word of God in our lives, we grab the very sword that the Holy Spirit alive in us will use to accomplish and defend what God has put him there to do. I want to go back and look at these verses from John 16 because I think to rush past these would be a mistake and there is, there is key stuff in these two verses. I want to look at my second slide. Let's go back to the first one. The end of it, he says, when he comes, he will convict the world concerning, and he lists three things, that the Holy Spirit will come and he will convict the world on three points. Number one, concerning sin, Number two, righteousness. Number three, judgment. And then he explains. He says, concerning sin, the Holy Spirit will come and will convict the world concerning sin because they do not believe in me. The par part of the reason that the Holy Spirit, get, God has given him to us to indwell us and empower us is to convict the world of sin. How does that happen? So the Holy Spirit wants to convict the world of sin. When he's alive in us, he creates in an extremely authentic way fruit. Fruit of the Spirit. What are those fruits of the Spirit? They are love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And it says, against such there is no law. The Holy Spirit fills us to show us, show in us who Jesus was. Do you remember the reaction of the world when Jesus was here? What was the world's reaction? They despised him. They hated him. Well, why did they not like him? They didn't like him because they wanted to live legal, legality. They wanted to have a list of rules if they were a Pharisee. And they wanted to say, you do this and 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 this, and then you're okay with God and God's holiness will dwell on you and he will bless you. But it really made it a really man-controllable system. When Jesus came, he blew that out of the water and he said, it's more about heart than it is about law. He said, I desire obedience more than sacrifice. Their world revolved around a tithing and they would tithe on their their livestock and their income and their spices and they would they just made it this really legalistic type of situation and Jesus just went to the heart and he did things that upset the apple cart for them because they wanted to know how to narrow everything down and control it all put it on a sheet of paper and be able to have a, a list that they could control and he blew that out and he brought hope to the hopeless and healing to the sick and forgiveness to the wretched to anyone who would admit who they were, the tax collector, the woman caught in adultery. 
all these people, he didn't contemn them. But he, he gifted them with himself, and then he died for the world. So we are called to be willing to lay down our life for people and to serve Jesus with all of our hearts and to be salt and light. And when that happens, your life will convict this world because they don't know him. And they can't figure out why a life would live the way your life is being lived. And not everyone will like it. People will accuse you of being judgmental. That's why it's so important to be salt and light, to correct people with compassion, to come alongside them, to call sin what it is, but not to pretend that it doesn't ever exist in you. But for the grace of God, there go I. So he sent him into the world to judge the world or convict the world concerning sin because they don't know him. What's the next one? Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see no longer see me. What does he mean by that? Listen, Jesus was here for a short time, and the world could look at him and see the Father. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, right? Who, how are they going to see him now? Do you know the word Christian, which sadly is becoming a term that has no punch because many people wear the tag, but they are not disciples, and they're not connected into the vine. Their life is not lived through him. They just are, hey, red, white, and blue. God bless America, I'm a Christian. But they're not disciples of him. Their life is not surrendered to him. That is the difference. When your life is surrendered to him, you can wear that tag because it means little Christ. If your life isn't laying down itself for other people, if your life isn't finding opportunities to, to get quiet before God and say, Lord, what is it in me that you don't like? What is it in me that you want to change? As David said, Lord, show me the wickedness in me and lead me in your way. If your life isn't willing to pay a price to see other people blessed, if your life isn't willing to be humble and maybe lose possessions for the furthering of the gospel and lost people's lives, if your life isn't willing to do that, then are you really a little Christ? Are you? When Jesus left, his presence and the ability for the world to see him vanished. So when he sends the Holy Spirit, guess what happens? We become little Christ. He told them to wait in the upper room so that they would be filled with power from on high. Look what happens on the day that happens. They're filled. They begin to speak with the languages of the people around them. Everyone, thousands of people, heard the truth of the gospel and who Jesus was through the mouths of these nobodies. They were nobodies. But they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And they became little Christ. They became what Jesus looked like on this earth. And they even went so far as to heal the sick, raise people from the dead, Miraculous things happened, and what lit on fire was the beginning of what we are doing right now. Lives were changed. That is why he says, concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer, and neither will the world. Now, real quick, I say this all the time. What is righteousness? Righteousness is being perfect and pure and blameless, and only God owns that. It only belongs to him. Righteousness, when it appears in my life, is there for one reason. I've put my trust in him, he has washed my sin away, and he has made me right in his sight. And because my faith is in him, he accounts my faith as righteousness, and he puts his righteousness on me. That's how it happens. He puts his righteousness on me. We are supposed to be Jesus in this world. Am I going to live perfectly? Will I look exactly like him? I sure won't. But when people see me and they experience my life, they ought to know why I live the way I do. And they ought to see Jesus in me. There's a song by uh, Audio Adrenaline from years ago that says, I want to be your hands. I want to be your feet. I'll go where you send me. I'll go where you send me. 
We really need to be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. All right. The third one, concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Let me tell you, why do Christians wear crosses on their neck? Why do we put crosses on the wall? Why do we use the cross as a symbol of our faith? I'll say this. It's because the cross of Jesus Christ is the turning point in all of human history. At that point, he took back authority. He took the keys to hell and death. And he said, death no longer reigns in this place. The Bible says that re death reigned from Adam to Moses, came up. But in the same way that by one man sin entered the world and death through sin, so by one man death met its match and was defeated. When he rose from the grave, he said, that thing that's going to take every flesh down in this world and put you in the grave, it belongs to me. I own it, and I am now the prince of this whole thing. All authority has been given to me by the Father. He's the owner, and you will not be a victim of the grave for all eternity. Your flesh will surely, surely die but you will be raised to life with him again. And that's what he was proving when he rose from the grave. There's a VeggieTales film, uh, if you're a big fan of VeggieTales, about um, Resurrection Sunday. It's called The Easter Carol. And it uses Dickens' story and tells the story of Easter through it. And uh, Rebecca St. James sings a song in this little film, and one of the lines says, He died on the cross to give us life but to give us hope, he rose. It was like he went to the cross and he died on the cross and the disciples didn't know what was going on and people were weeping and they thought that what they had hoped in had died and failed and that the Messiah, that what happened and we don't know and even the two on the road to Emmaus are, are describing to Jesus like, where have you been? Don't you know? Like we had hoped in this man and we thought that he was the one son of God and then he was killed and now we don't know what to do. He rose from the grave to put a huge stamp in blood red on the story to say, oh yeah, I meant what I said. This temple right here will be torn down, but in three days I will build it back up. The grave has no power. Oh death, where is your sting? Oh grave, where is your victory? He drove home the fact that he now owns the place. So for three reasons, what now? Well, what now is the Holy Spirit? What now is us being empowered by the Spirit of God to live who Jesus was in this world till he comes back? For three reasons. To show the world that they have something that they're missing. That used to be the law, and it still is, but now it's us too. What's missing from my life? I'm seeing life in people. Why don't I have it? Number two, to show people what he looks like. So number one is to, to let them know that there's something missing. Number two is to show them what it is that's missing. And number three is we can do it all because our enemy's defeated and we are now empowered by the Spirit of God. The old boss is out of the way. There's a new owner in town. Time for the business to turn around and do some crazy good stuff. That's what this is saying. Now our next verse, when we go into Ephesians 6, 17, take the helmet of salvation, his death on the cross and resurrection from the, from the grave. Take that helmet. What does that do? That helmet, it guards your thoughts. Paul says, take every thought captive. Listen, if you can spend a day and not think of the fact that you are owned by the one who bought you on the cross by his blood, you need to jumble your day around, man. That ought to be the central thought of your entire day. When you wake up in the morning, you ought to think, okay, Holy Spirit, it's you and me in that order. You dragging me wherever I'm supposed to go doing what you want to do in me. You're my strength. You're my power. I want you to produce the fruit that you produce in my life. Why? Because my life will be better? Well, yeah, that is part of it. But there's a lost world that we're sent here in this foreign place to reach for the glory of his name. Put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You have got to plant the Word of God in your heart and in your mind and guard it with the helmet of salvation so that when the Spirit needs to do work in you, whether that's dividing even to soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning your thoughts and intents, 
convicting you of sin and, and cutting that out of you and making you more right before him, then he's got the word of God right there to do that. If it's sharing the truth of the gospel with a lost person, he's going to pick up the sword, the word of God, and it's going to come out of you, and it's going to be used to cut down the lies of the enemy and to plant truth into the hearts of people. Listen, when Jesus comes back and he makes everything right again, the Bible says that we're going to beat our swords into plowshares. Well, I'm going to tell you that you can use the sword of the Spirit as a plowshare now. Because in the parable of the sower, the ground is the heart. And sometimes that ground needs to be opened up by a plow, the word of God, so that the seed of the gospel can be planted in it and grow. So that sword is used for all kinds of stuff right now. I want to turn to the book of Galatians, chapter 5, verses 19 to 23. This is talking about the fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit, okay? It lists the fruit of the flesh first and then the Spirit. Listen to what it says, Galatians 5, 19 to 23. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If these things are the typical every day in your life, the word of God says you need to repent and turn from sin and turn to him. Am I saying, hey, Dave the pastor is a good guy and you're bad? No, I'm saying Dave the pastor is a bad guy who just figured out by the spirit of God's leading in the word of God that he wants to wash my sin away and I'm asking him to do that. Listen, as a human being, I sin but it's not the signature of my life. If drunkenness is the signature of your life, if envy is the signature of your life, if, if these things listed, fits of anger and jealousy and strife and sorcery and idolatry, listen, if you're into sorcery and going and trying to get man to tap into spirits to tell you what your tomorrow's gonna be, you're relying on something aside from him and he, hate, he hates that. He doesn't hate you, but he hates that. He's jealous, man. He wants your attention. He wants you to depend on him. I'm telling you, if these things are the signature of your life, you need to turn from them and embrace who he is and ask him to wash your life clean, to, to come and live in your life and to make you new. Because the Bible, the word of God says that if these are the signature of your life, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because your belief, your trust is in the power of man. It's in spiritual things that you don't even understand. It's in your own anger, your own control. You don't rely on him. You're relying on you. And that is a form of idol worship. Listen, if you're worshiping your own ability to make everything right, you're worshiping an idol. It's not made of wood and stone. It's made of blood and guts. But it's not God. This is a hard thing to hear, but I'm telling you, I'm handing you truth in this place. I need this as much as you do. You need this. Let's look at the fruit of the Spirit. This is what your life can become. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Is this what people know you as? Do they know you as peaceful, patient, faithful? Do they know you as kind and gentle? Do they know you as being slow to anger because you have self-control? Do they know you as a self-controlled person? Or do they know you as a person of one vice or another in your life? This says, against such there is no law. Listen, when you live filled with the Holy Spirit, you're not under the law, you're under grace. God is saying, hey, you're gonna, there will be some mistakes and it's not okay. They have to be paid for by the blood on the cross and they are paid for. But I want you to live something different than everybody else lives. And these things are worth having in your life today. We, we say all the time, uh, money can't buy happiness. Well, relationships can't buy happiness. All this thing can't buy happiness. This can't buy happiness. What buys happiness? This list of things that are the fruit of the Spirit is where happiness comes from. I'm telling you where to find them. In, in chapter 8 of the book of Romans, Paul, Paul really kind of paints this picture of a battle that's going on. 
So Jesus came and he led his disciples. They were clueless for three years. He died on the cross. They were still pretty clueless. They, didn't, they knew who he was and what he had done. They believed he was the Messiah, the Son of God. But it wasn't until after he rose from the grave and he opened their minds to the word of God. He did it on the road to Emmaus and in Jerusalem. And I believe for 40 days, their minds were opened to understand what the word of God was and they were pouring over it and they were filling themselves with the word of God. And then on the day of Pentecost, now what? What next? He filled them with the power of the Spirit of God and sent them out to do the thing that he told them to do in Matthew 28. Go to all the nations and make disciples, baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he said, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And then he sends his comforter, the Holy Spirit, to empower us. What next is this? We need to be asking the Holy Spirit to fill us for Jesus to send us the power of the Holy Spirit to live in us, to purge out sin, to give us power to be salt and light in our world, that we could serve him, that we could share the gospel and live something that is different than everyone around us. Our lives ought to look like the early church. We ought to have times where we say, Lord, please give us boldness to preach your word. And if we face persecution for that, Lord, fill us with gentleness and kindness, but a boldness that speaks the truth about sin in this world. I'm going to tell you, it is not enough to know about him. It is not enough to be familiar with the traditions of a Sunday service. It's not familiar to know all the taglines everybody knows, half of which aren't even in the Bible. You know, you get what you earn. Not in the Bible. He won't give me anything I can't handle. Not in the Bible. Listen, this whole place is something we can't handle. That's why he came and died on the cross. He says to the one who works and is paid, it's a wage. It's what he deserves. But blessed is the one who trusts in him who justifies the ungodly for his faith is counted as righteousness. No one ever is in right standing before God because of what they did. They're in right standing before God because of why. When faith and trust in him is the why, that is counted to you as righteousness. What you do is not as important as why. When he's the reason, you stand righteous before him. When there's any other reason there, you're on your own. You're going to be paid a wage, and it's not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough. My challenge for you today is very simple, very simple. You need to ask God to empower your life with his Holy Spirit that you would produce fruit. Remember in John 15, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Anyone who's not a part of me won't produce any fruit. And if they don't produce fruit, they're going to be cut off and thrown into the fire. And he says in that section, without me, you can do nothing, nothing at all. Where we follow Jesus is where he laid down his life on the cross. He says, take up your cross and follow me. Paul says, I know I choose and endeavor to know nothing but Christ and him crucified. What's that even mean? What do those two things mean? They mean this. You need to lay down your life. You need to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Whatever it is you choose to do in my life to glorify your name and redeem the lost, I surrender to you. That is how you take up your cross and follow him. You deny the things you want and the things you like and the things you think you need and you lay down your life for the furtherance of the salvation of lost people. Paul said, that's all I care to know. Why? Because unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it can produce nothing. We lay down our lives like he did. When we're baptized, we go into the grave, and when we come out, we say, hey, no longer the owner, you're the owner. Here's the keys, drive this thing. Fill me with the gas, the fuel, the power of the Holy Spirit, and you drive this car. This whole thing is that simple. That's what's going on in the life of Christ. He dies, raises from the grave, day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit falls and empowers us. This is what's next. You've come to the place where you know him, you surrendered your life to him. The next thing is, Holy Spirit, live in me. Produce fruit through me. I'm going to lay down my life, give you control, and ask you to do what you want to do through me. What's he going to do when you pray that? I don't know. Guess what? 
The people in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, they didn't know there was going to be a mighty rushing wind. They didn't know that there were going to be cloven tongues of fire above them. They didn't know that they would be out in the community a week later raising the guy at the gate beautiful. They, they didn't know that they would speak in the tongues of men that they from countries they had never been to. They didn't know that they were pretty much all going to die for their faith, all the disciples. Stephen didn't know he was going to die a couple weeks or a month down the road. They didn't know these things. We don't know what he's going to do in us. But I'm not going to hesitate to ask him to fill my life with his power because I'm afraid of what he might do. Because here's the thing. He's good. He's good. And he says, come on, get in the harness with me. Work with me. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. You will find rest for your soul. I want him to light my life on fire so that I'm excited in what he calls me to do. And I want you to have the same thing. If you've never surrendered to the power of the cross, I'm inviting you to do it today, not to impress me or to become a number in a church building. He says that you deserve his love because he made you in his image, not because of what you've done or haven't done. He loves you. He wants to save you and redeem you and make something of you. Please grab onto that. Just ask for it. It's that simple. It's that simple.